mean? And how then should I live? Since as far back as I could remember, these two questions have haunted me. Thankfully, I'm not alone. They've haunted most of humanity for most of our history. Over the course of our evolution, we've come up with a variety of different answers to these questions. Some referring to myths and gods and heroes, others to the impersonal laws of nature. Some referring to hard qualities like courage, determination, overcoming. Others to softer qualities like cooperation, empathy. Some seeking the attainment of states of inner peace, calm, detachment. Others favoring a passionate enjoyment of all of life's pleasures. Does the very fact that we've come up with so many different answers, some of them contradictory to one another, evidence of our eternal confusion? Maybe it's a sign that there is no definitive answer to these questions. Or maybe the answer isn't meant to be general in the first place. Maybe it's meant to be more specific, situational, perhaps even personal to each one of us. I grew up in a traditional Jewish community, born of first-generation Moroccan immigrants. Growing up, we were taught to trust and follow the elders. In our case, it was the rabbis. They had the time-tested answers, straight from the perfect holy books. But our generation was different. We were the first in our lineage to be born in North America, and so we grew up watching blockbuster comedies and playing video games and watching 24 hours news channels. We were also exposed to scientific education from day one, and so we questioned the rabbis in ways they weren't used to being questioned. And they didn't like it. They would tell us stories about miracles, and we would just like mock and ruthlessly like grill them. There was one exception to them, though. He was to us the beardless rabbi for some reason. He had a humility about him, a pragmatism that the other ones didn't. So one day I remember when we were getting rowdy, he closed his creaky leather book full of chalk, looked up to us and said, you know, guys, we don't have all the answers here. We're just planting some seeds, hoping that you guys will do good to one another, do good things in the world, and hopefully one day some of these seeds will grow. And we were like, hmm, interesting, but it's more fun to make fun of the other ones, so we just put our attention there. And, you know, they'd refer to their own divine authority, and we just progressively tuned them out. So when I graduated from high school, as you can imagine, I started looking for answers in other places. I felt maybe another tradition will have better answers. I read a lot of philosophy, read a lot of literature, exposed myself to pop culture, anything my mind could fancy. There were a lot of great answers and tidbits and fragments in these explorations. My problem was they were too exotic. They were out there. I couldn't find a way to make sense of them in my actual life. Mostly, though, I fell in love with the scientific way of looking at the world. Science was about the universal rules that were backed up by the real evidence. It was about how the world really worked with all due respect to your feelings and stories. I just fell in love with this way of looking at the world. It was so much more modern and also more compatible with the kind of fun life that the religious life didn't seem to give us. But even there, the specter of meaninglessness followed me, and it was best put into words by my physics professor, a hardened, older Eastern European woman with a really dry sense of humor. And she would look up to us and she'd say, you know, guys, um, it doesn't matter what you tell yourselves, and it doesn't matter what your teachers tell you, it doesn't matter, none of the stuff you read really matters in the end because in the end, there is the law of entropy, and you cannot avoid it. And it's the three Ds. It's disorder, destruction, and death. And so, just enjoy yourselves as much as you can while you can. Wow, that made such an impression on us. Enjoy yourself as much as you can while you can. I realize today that became my go-to for a good 15 years of my life, the hedonic, utilitarian life. I started looking at life as just a collection of experiences, trying to chase as many pleasurable ones as possible, trying to avoid painful ones, distracting myself from what my physics professor convincingly argued was my own inevitable disappearance. But it turns out that all of this chasing 
and avoiding and distracting forms various forms of traps over the course of years as you keep practicing it over the years. When I'd experience a pleasurable experience, it was the problem of hedonic adaptation. I needed more and more stimulation just to get the same level of satisfaction. When I'd achieve a career goal, it was the achiever's curse. It was, what about this next goal that you haven't achieved yet? And then on to the next one, and this one didn't fulfill me as much as I thought it would. It was never enough. And of course, in the meantime, there were the moments between the experiences where sometimes it was boredom, sometimes it was confusion and anxiety, sometimes it was just emptiness. And as these moments started visiting me more and more often and kind of spreading, I had to be honest with myself and say, wait a minute, something is missing here. In fact, something pretty important is missing here. It may even be the most important things that are missing here. A sense of wholeness and authenticity. A sense of direction and something I believe in. The sense of being part of something greater than I am. You know, in the hedonic life, it was ultimately me alone in a big empty cosmos waiting to disappear. Is that really all we can expect out of life? I started looking for a pattern, a connective thread between all the different fragments of answers that I had bought into over the years and I just couldn't really find one until one day I found it in the lyric to a song of all places and it took me a while to realize that that was the answer and it occurred to me that whether the answers came from science or religion or philosophy, the common thread was always it was never about the whole me. It was never about the details of my actual life. I was always the student, the listener, the citizen. It was always me having to plug into the answer that somebody else had kind of prescripted for me. The lyric is from an Eddie Vedder song when he says, I knew the rules, but the rules didn't know me. And so sometimes in life, you need a reset when the mind starts going into too many directions, when confusion rises, sometimes you just need to slow down, take a little step back, and reconnect to one thing that you feel has always been authentically you. For some people, that's music. For other people, it's art. For some people, it's family. For some people, it's a strong connection to one particular individual or connection to nature. For me, it had always been seeking for wisdom from great teachers and great books. Only this time, I would truly focus this around my search for authentic meaning and purpose, not for career advancement, not for pleasure. As I was having these conversations with my wife, she said, you know, maybe you should reread Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And my initial reaction was, no, not interested. I mean, th there was a sense of been there, done that. I had read it. I remember it was a very short read. I had read it as part of a Holocaust course I took. And I told her, listen, you know, life is not that simple. I'm not just going to find the answer to the puzzle of meaning in life from a book called The Search for Meaning in Life. It just doesn't work that way. If only life were that simple. But she brought it on a flight that we had. And I just took it and started paging through it with very little interest initially. And lo and behold, uh, not the first or last time, but my wife was right and I was wrong. Talk about a puzzle. A couple of key insights from Frankel hit me like the centerpiece of a puzzle that started making everything else around it make a lot more sense. For Frankel, meaning and purpose are always about something really personal that you have the chance to realize in the future. And that's ultimately about you giving or contributing to something other than yourself. In his case, in the camps, it was two things. It was the chance to be reunited with his wife, who was pregnant at the time with their first child, and the chance to complete his manuscript on the psychology of meaning, which he'd already started writing. Now, he knew in the camps that neither goal was very likely to ever happen. He was noticing his best friends getting shot, getting put in the gas chambers around them for no reason. He thought, this is probably going to happen to me next, probably going to happen to my wife, probably going to happen to both of us. But the very fact that they could happen in the future gave him a reason to hold on to life that would justify any amount of personal suffering. In the end, one of these goals 
did end up happening, the other one didn't. He finally did publish his manuscript, which became an instant bestseller, and which helped millions of people around the world, still does to this day. But his wife and unborn child never did make it out of the camps alive. Just like plants lean towards the sun, Frankel writes, all of life always points at something other than itself. That's what gives it a connection to and a significance that goes beyond the reality of its own death and suffering. Meaning isn't something that somebody else is going to give you magically, a pill, a pronouncement, a quote that somebody can just give you from the top down. Instead, we are each entangled in a very particular situation. And it's in that situation that we're hitting, that we're touching those things that are not us and where the opportunity for meaning and purpose exist. What is the meaning of life? Frankel told stories about how he would make fun of students for asking this question. It is the wrong question. It's a misnomer. It would be almost like asking the question, what is the right song? Or what is the right move in chess? The answer is way too particular to what's actually going on, to what level of the game you're at, who you're playing against. And of course, life is a lot more complex than chess. Behind Frankl's ideas is a very simple realization that each and every single one of us is a unique combination of experiences and attributes. And until we connect those to a bigger picture in a truly authentic way, meaning and purpose will elude us. You know, biologists like to say that we are genetically 98% the same as chimps. And that's true, guilty as charged. And that we are over 99% the same as one another. That's also true, but it's also misleading. Because that less than 1% still represents a lot of genetic material. It's estimated that the average difference between one individual genome and the reference genome, a kind of a reference human being created by geneticists, is 20 million base pairs. A friend and medical researcher friend of mine told me that a difference in a single one of those base pairs can make a massive difference in a person's phenotype and personal characteristics. The same is true of psychology. With my medical researcher friend, I took two widely used psychometric tests, the Big Five Personality Scale and the Via Character Strength Survey developed by Martin Seligman. And we took all of the questions leading up to the results and we broke them down in just three categories, high, medium, or low, depending on your score. We wanted to find out how many potential combinations exist in answering the questions themselves. Just two tests. The answer wasn't in the billions. It wasn't even in the trillions. It was in one of those orders of number that we don't even talk about. But then, if we keep stacking on more personal characteristics of yours and environmental characteristics, your place of birth, your parents' place of birth, the language, your mother tongue, um, where you went to school, the movies that touched you when you were young, your gender, your race, all of that stuff. The depth of your unique experience keeps going deeper and deeper. We are each a deep ocean of unique characteristics and experiences, and as a result, our paths on this planet are equally as unique. You know, it's often said that we live in an age of extreme individualism, and that's true. Individualism definitely has its dark sides. You know, each of us is expected to define themselves as an individual, fight and make a living as an individual. We're more separated from our ancestral groups than previous generations. But in this modern reality also comes an opportunity. The opportunity to find our truly unique voices and to make personalized contributions to humanity. For the first time ever, truly personal purpose can be unleashed on a massive scale. You know, in the ancient world, the answers to these questions and the values we developed were developed by people who had power and influence inside of the small human communities that we lived in. And so, in the answers, first of all, they wanted to make sure that they held on to that power and influence, but they also wanted to make sure that groups stayed cohesive and that the group survived. And so it was very important for individuals to plug into these answers. Purpose started with we and imposed itself on me. But in order to work for in the modern world, for highly differentiated individuals such as we are today, purpose must flow in the opposite direction. From me to we. 
This involves each and every single one of us developing a giver's mindset. Tapping into the power of giving is a tremendous gift in and of itself. Ed O'Brien's amazing work at the University of Chicago shows that, you know, we get pleasure from taking, sure, that's why we do it. The problem is that that pleasure depletes itself, goes down very quickly over time. That's what we have to keep taking. We also get pleasure from giving. He shows this in beautiful behavioral psychology experiments. The difference is that the pleasure we get from giving goes down a lot slower. Turns out that the energy of giving is a lot more sustainable than the energy of just taking. There are two basic ways that this works in. The first one is when we make a productive or creative contribution in an area connected to our work. Purpose is an unbelievable accelerator in people's careers and work. You know, it's often said that we should follow our passion. Well, Morton Hansen, a professor at Berkeley, um, ran a five-year study of 5,000 managers and employees and found that those who had passion but no purpose only placed in the 20th percentile of performers. Those who had purpose and no passion did a lot better. They were in the 64th percentile of performers. The best ones, of course, had both purpose and passion. That's the ideal. They placed in the 80th percentile of performers. But one thing is for sure, that if you are separating yourself from the energy of purpose in your work life, you are severely handicapping yourself. The second way is a lot smaller and a lot more immediate. And it's making an actual contribution, act of giving around you a helpful conversation with a friend, a client, a person, any person that you're meeting that comes across your path, a random act of kindness, even a small practical contribution like watering a plant or walking a pet. Small does not mean that it is small in its consequences. We have dozens of studies today showing that purpose literally alters the brain. It reduces activity in the amygdala making us less stressful, less anxious, and correlates with all kinds of measures of well-being. Having high scores in the purpose and life scale is shown to be associated to a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, Alzheimer's, inflammation, substance abuse. And having meaning of life is right at the top of factors that can protect people against depression as people age. We're finally at a time where modern science and ancient wisdom seem to be converging on this point, that purpose is like a loop in three steps. And it starts with something really personal, really intimately connected to who you are, immediate, in your actual environment. It then goes to you from that place, giving or contributing to something other than yourself. And then finally, the loop gets closed when you get rewarded for this, by your inner biology and by the world at large. And that energy keeps getting stronger every time the loop closes. And we start slowly, slowly feeling part of things bigger than ourselves. And we start to experience what people call meaning, a richer symbolic connection with the world around us. We plant seeds and some of them grow. We don't necessarily get to pick which ones will grow and how they will grow. Each one of us only gets to choose whether or not the seed they plant is truly theirs. Because in the end, my physics professor was also right. There is entropy. There are the three Ds of disorder, destruction, and death. We cannot get around it. But that doesn't mean that we can't live longer and better lives in the meantime, giving to the world around us in ways that will have ripple effects way beyond us and that will ultimately outlive us. And in doing so, to infuse our lives and the lives of our communities with the energy of purpose. And all of it starts by fully owning the realization that purpose is, to a large degree, personal.